Hello VR class, I hope you're all doing well, staying happy, healthy, and safe. Uh, today we're going to be talking about virtual humans and other non-player characters. So first of all, what is a non-player character? Well, non-player characters are uh, other individuals or actors in a, a video game or virtual environment uh, that you're going to be interacting with that might not necessarily be represented by a real intelligence like yourself, perhaps an artificial intelligence, uh, perhaps uh, something as, as rudimentary as when you get close to it, it tells you something or it, it, it uh, tries to attack or some, something like that. Uh, but, but the concept of NPCs are really fundamental to, to most video games and many virtual environments. For instance, I remember playing this video game back, we're not going to talk about when, uh, but, but, but quite a while ago. Uh, this was uh, Berserk, I think, on uh, the Atari 2600. And here you are. Here you are the player. And you're interacting with these uh, robot characters throughout the seed. And you're, you're trying not to get caught by them, trying not to get attacked. Uh, and these guys don't look terribly real. But, and I wish I'd included a picture of, of like, the, the box cover art for... Uh, for, for some of the Atari video games, especially this one, uh, these guys don't look anything like what would be on the cover of the box. But to you, the player, seeing these guys and being primed by what that box gave you, the cover, as an expectation, uh, you'd be like, oh my gosh, these guys, they're so real. They're coming after me. They're doing this. They're doing that. So you end up becoming fairly involved with these terribly drawn, highly pixelated virtual characters. Uh, you know, and you know, they're, they're, they're not quite as realistic as my, uh, my uh, virtual persona here in front of you right now. But uh, as time progresses, things become more advanced and more complicated. And you know, you end up with characters that do more than just chase you around trying to kill you. For instance, this. Ah, good old Legend of Zelda on the original. Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, yeah, we, we know it now as NES. Back in the day, it was just Nintendo because it was the only one. <laughs> uh, anyway, but I have spent many, many hours playing this, this wonderful game. And this character here, he doesn't really do anything. He gives you this sword. You show up, and he's like, It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. And he gives you a sword. He doesn't really move around. He doesn't actually talk to you. But his presence there adds to the story. It brings you deeper into this world. So you now have a sword that some creepy old man in a cave gave you, you know? Uh, so even though he's not really that complicated, you do get some, some nice little visuals, you know? He's obviously in a robe of some sort. He has hands, he has feet, and a beard. Because, you know, that's what all sages need. A nice beard. Anyway, so... This little character, despite his lack of complexity, helps bring you into the scene. Now, in other games, uh, the, the NPCs are more vital. Uh, their behaviors are very important for your interactions in the game. Uh, for instance, uh, this is a screenshot from uh, the original Half-Life-based Counter-Strike. And this is one of the, 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 the hostage um, rescue missions. And so the whole premise of this game, or this, this particular uh, instance of the game, is you would go and you would sneak through your enemy's territory, and it was multiplayer, so you got a team of enemies and a team of friendlies, and then you would go and you would find the hostages. And then you'd walk up to the hostages, and then they would follow you out. And they had a primitive AI that would help you know, them navigate and try to follow you. Now granted, they didn't look terribly realistic, and they're all weird, creepy, bald clones of some sort, uh, but it was really cool that you could get in the game and then you could interact with these non-human characters, and they would behave somewhat realistically. And by somewhat realistically, I mean they would follow you, but only sometimes. Uh, their, their, their path following AI was a little bit bad because sometimes you would go and rescue all the hostages, and then you would get them out to their extraction point, and the game wouldn't end. Why? Because you're one hostage short. And you go back and you trace your route and you find one of these guys stuck up against the corner of a room doing this. Can't walk around the corner. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one, one instance, you know, where 
uh, the, the, the AI might not have actually been too helpful. But still, having this and having done this when it was something new, this brought an incredible and new depth to the gaming experience. Uh, suddenly these 3D characters were responding to you, and in a way, you were kind of really rescuing them. You were going into the world, you were getting them, you were extracting them, and they were following you, responding intelligently to the things that you were doing, trying to save them. Now, they're looking more realistic and behaving more realistic than uh, uh, some other, other games we've talked about, uh, but then, you know, sometimes realism isn't necessary. So this is this is one of my my favorites. Uh, I almost don't even want to call it a game. It's more like an experience. Uh, it's a game experience called Journey, where you're uh, you you just sort of wake up in this desert, and the story unfolds as you go through it. Turns out you're you're a being that's made of cloth. All living creatures on this planet are are, are made of cloth. It's really it's really bizarre and weird and a beautiful game. But the interesting thing, and a friend of mine told me to play this game, didn't give me much information about it, just said, Adam, you're going to love this game. So I started playing it, and as I was playing it, uh, another character showed up and started helping me out. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And you can't really communicate in the game. You can't talk or ch chat or text or anything like that. Uh, but you can press a button, and when you press that button, you make a little energy bubble that goes whoop. And you can sort of like tap out, you know, whoop, 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 whoop. And uh, so if you got close to the other character and you did the little whoop button, the little character would do it back. And it was really cute. Now what was really interesting is if you were in a bind on one other part of the map, you could go whoop, 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 you know, sort of calling for help. And the other character would come. And as I played through the game, I was like, there's something creepy about this. It, this, 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 this NPC just feels weird. It's, it's... I don't know, I can't, couldn't put my finger on it until I got to the end of the game. And when you get to the end of the game, you find out that you're actually playing with other people the whole time. And I guess if you'd actually read up on the game beforehand, you would have known this. Uh, but I don't, and my friend intentionally didn't tell me this so that I would be surprised at the end that this whole time I wasn't playing with an NPC. I was playing through this game with another person. And it's really shocking that even though the communication channel we were using was just essentially like an on-off, boop, boop, you could still communicate in a way that felt intelligent. And turns out that feeling of intelligence behind the beeps was actually what was probably making me feel somewhat, I don't know, almost unsettled with these really cool characters. Now, they don't all have to be terribly intelligent uh, or even terribly human-like. Uh, NPCs uh, can sometimes be completely inanimate, like the good old companion cube in the game Portal. So, for those of you who haven't played Portal, uh, the companion cube is a cube that during a particular level you're supposed to protect, and the game keeps telling you the companion cube is your friend. And so you end up carrying the companion cube around through the level, and eventually you've got to sacrifice it, but that, that that's a whole other story. Uh, but people became obsessed with the companion cube. You can find companion cube plushies and keychains and shirts and, and whatnot. And the companion cube, despite it just being a box with a heart drawn on it that for this le particular level you had to keep with you, uh, it, it became a compelling character, even though it did nothing. The character was entirely supported by the narrative of the story. And having this weird little box that you were instructed to treat as a friend uh, ended up bringing the a human sort of aspect to it. It's really kind of neat. Now, we often uh, see NPCs of a sto sort in, say, cartoons and comic books and those kind of things, and they, they have human-like features despite not being human. I mean, this, this, is, this is good old Winnie the Pooh. Uh, he's not necessarily a video game character. Well, there might be a Winnie the Pooh video game. I don't know. But, uh, you know, you're, you're probably definitely familiar with him from things like uh, like uh, little children's storybooks and cartoons and that. He's an adorable and lovable character. And, you know, in real life, uh, bears can be somewhat scary. Uh, but, you know, Winnie the Pooh, he's not scary, man. Look at him. He's adorable. And he's, he's a somewhat anthropomorphic, you know. 
he's got a very human smile and and cute little eyebrows looking at you and is sort of timidly like hello you know he's he's adorable but we can make certain tweaks to this character that might change our perception of him uh, for instance if you aren't familiar with these things uh, these are little dental training stuffed animals they're used to uh, hypothetically uh, make children more comfortable with uh, uh, having dental work done. Now this is the most terrifying thing I have ever seen in my life. And I've seen some stuff, man. Anyway, but this thing is genuinely terrifying. But if you look at the two of them, they're, they're really not that different. They're both somewhat anthropomorphized little golden teddy bears. The main difference is that instead of having a cute little toothless grin, suddenly you have these hyper-realistic human teeth inside of this otherwise adorable little creature. And suddenly, it stops being adorable and starts being terrifying. This, my friend, brings us to what I hope is my next slide. Oh, it's not. <laughs> but we'll get there. And we, we see similar effects in, in, in movies all the time, especially movies that are supposed to be somewhat realistic in their visuals, but also have a bit of cartoonishness to them. Uh, all of these characters, in a way, look very human, but in a way, they also look very unsettling. But you sometimes can't quite put your finger on what it is that's making them feel unsettling. And I'm certain the next slide is what I really want to talk about. Yes, the Uncanny Valley. So the Uncanny Valley refers to an interesting phenomena uh, with non-player characters, virtual humans, uh, robotics, anything that's, that's designed to sort of be like a human interacting actor. Uh, you have this interesting phenomena where we're actually okay and pretty darn accepting of a character that doesn't look very human-like. For instance, like, like an industrial robot or a companion cube looks nothing like a human. But we don't really feel uncomfortable with them. They're, they're just sort of things that are there with us. But uh, as, as they become more and more human-like, we start feeling a little more comfortable with them. Sort of like the, and I wish I had a picture of it, the little cute, uh, almost sort of semi-anthropomorphic robots like uh, in, in one of the Portal spinoffs, or, or kind of like me. See? This guy right here doesn't look very human, but obviously very humanoid. So we're, we're getting more human-like in our appearance, and still don't feel terribly unnerved by it. Uh, it it's still kind of kind of cute and adorable. You know, kind of like as we're getting up to like Winnie the Pooh and stuffed animals. But then we reach a point where we cross a boundary, where we start looking just a little bit too human-like, and then the creep factor goes in. The comfortableness, how comfortable you are with this NPC or robot or whatever, begins to go way, way down the closer and closer you get to it being more human-like. And then slowly, as you begin to approach very human-looking again, it starts to go up to more comfortable. And it's really interesting. There's, there's this little gap in between perfectly human-like and almost perfectly human-like, where the thing, the robot, the virtual human, the NPC, whatever it is, actually feels very uncomfortable to us and kind of creeps us out a bit. And this is what's referred to as the uncanny valley. Uh, it's, it's often hard to avoid this, and it seems like this might be a moving target. Some things feel more uncomfortable for other people than, than well, some other folks. Uh, for instance, the, the animated movies we're looking at, for some people, those look perfectly acceptable. Nothing uncomfortable about them at all. While other people look at them like, oh my gosh, why is that child's teeth inverted? Or something like that. So, uh, as we're making virtual humans more and more human-like, uh, they tend to get comfortable, 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 and then very uncomfortable to work with until they get to a, a very high point of being very compellingly human. So, uh, we're getting better at doing this. This is, uh, this is virtual Ira. Uh, this was uh, a 3D scan and animation done of uh, Ari Shapiro. Uh, 
uh, an acquaintance of mine from, from, from uh, University of Southern California. This looks remarkably like Ari, except except Ari has hair. But he was called Virtual Ira, because you get it, Ira is Ari spelled backwards. And uh, this is not a photo. This is a 3D model of Ari. And it can talk, and it can look around, and it can be puppeteered, and it looks incredibly realistic. And uh, we're getting more and more to the point where we've got virtual humans. This is another completely synthetic human that looks incredibly real. Uh, everything down to how the light scatters below the surface of the skin, to how it interacts with things like our cornea and, and our iris, and it looks very, very compelling. Now, we don't necessarily have to have terribly realistic looking humans in order for them to be virtual humans, in order for them to be effective. Uh, so, a lot of training activities might actually be as effective, maybe, may, maybe equally or more effective, if it involves a virtual human that's not necessarily perfectly compelling. Uh, this is uh, this is Bob. This is uh, I've got a citation down here in the corner from Clemson University, a project that was looking at helping uh, train medical professionals in uh, monitoring the vitals of patients. And using this, you could run through the course of a day of the health of Bob and check his vitals and interact with him and talk to him. And this was a very compelling environment for people who are practicing, say, for nursing, uh, to learn the ins and outs of monitoring a patient who might be in critical condition. Uh, I don't know if it's for all the scenarios, but I know for at least a couple of them, poor Bob passes away at the end of the day. It's, it really pulls on your heartstrings. Uh, I remember, I remember when I was was seeing this when I was at Clemson. Uh, Bob would talk to you some casual chit chat, and sometimes even say things like, "Oh, my son, he's going to be coming later today. He said he was going to be coming yesterday, but I guess he was busy. I'm sure I'll see him soon." And then you, knowing that poor old Bob's going to pass away at the end of this exercise, it really, it literally sort of makes you makes you tear up a little bit inside. Sometimes even on the outside. Uh, so you end up getting somewhat emotionally involved even with these non-photorealistic characters. Uh, there's also been work looking at using virtual characters uh, for, for, for therapy purposes. Uh, there are sometimes instances where people might actually feel more comfortable interacting with a virtual human and talking to them about, about problems and things that could be going on with them than they would with physical human beings. Because even though you know that this is not a real human being. We still tend to treat virtual humans as such. Think back to that companion cube. Granted, we didn't t treat it as a confidant, but we had a great deal of affection for this weird little box, despite the fact that it looked nothing like a human. When you start dealing with things that do look human-like, we tend to start treating them like they're somewhat human-like. But, uh, with, say, a virtual therapist, uh, you know that it's not a human, and there's no judgment involved with something that isn't necessarily a real human being. And some people have, you know, uh, speculated using this as, as a gateway, a transition from uh, not being able to go to a therapist to someone being able to go to a therapist. Because there, there's sometimes a bit of resistance for people wanting to, to make that leap and make that commitment. And, uh, yeah, this is this is... Actually, the the the, sa the same topic, uh, but uh, a project that I think was at USC. I know it was at USC. Uh, I think it was called Project Braveheart, perhaps. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. That was intended to, you know, uh, investigate the possibility of using virtual humans as a means of getting people to open up to uh, to in-person therapy options. And uh, virtual humans are also often frequently used for, for things like exposure and resi resiliency uh, uh, training. So exposing people to environments before they go in for training purposes. And sometimes uh, to build up expectations of what they would see and experience when they go into some real situation. Uh, for instance, if you're doing something like uh, uh, training, uh, training soldiers for going out and being deployed in an area or training firefighters for going into a building. These people don't often do these tasks alone. So involving virtual humans that can act as other characters in the environment or even even puppeteered actual humans or, pu or 
puppeteered uh, virtual humans that are being represented, you know, controlled by uh, actual humans, uh, can be very, very helpful in making training and exposure and resiliency uh, uh, applications more realistic and more compelling. But now the thing you have to keep in mind is that it's not just about the realism of the human or the compellingness of the character. Sometimes the communication channel you're using is very important. For instance, uh, I know you can't see it because it's you. Uh, there's a virtual robot, it's very similar to me, standing right here whose view is being recorded. And I'm communicating to this robot in this virtual world. I'm actually giving this lecture to you. And uh, from my point of view, you're fairly compelling. Your little eyes track me as I move around the room. And uh, it's, 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 it's nice. It, it's very uh, almost welcoming to be talking to you in this way. Uh, but similarly, you know, playing on uh, a small CRT color television from like 1987 or something uh, uh, with the Berserker robot game, that still felt very compelling. It might not feel as compelling if you're watching that in 4K these days because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a different expectation for a different communication mechanism. Now, virtual humans in particular aren't perfect. We're, we're, we're getting better. But one of the things you can do to make a virtual human more compelling is to force limitations on the way that you communicate with them. For instance, if you play some, some VR video games, uh, humans aren't, aren't terribly realistic. Uh, so sometimes you're forced to communicate with them through telephones or, or video screens in the virtual world, and they feel more realistic that way. For instance, in uh, the video game Budget Cuts that you play in, in, in VR, uh, you frequently have to pick up the phone and talk to another NPC who then gives you instructions. Now, if you want to interact uh, with, say, a virtual human, uh, one thing to do is, say, you know, maybe use a communication channel that doesn't have highly realistic expectations. For instance, uh, again, the group at USC uh, did a small study looking at uh, talking to a virtual human over Skype, video chat. So video chat, and as many of you know, since we're having to do a lot of video chatting these days, uh, isn't perfect. It sometimes has compression artifacts. The video reses up and reses down frequently. It might stutter. Uh, the audio compression might go weird, and the person might sound robotic or something. Uh, but you still know it's a real human on the other end. Well, in this particular uh, example, uh, they experimented with having the virtual human call you on Skype. You know, still know it's a virtual human. I remember trying this one myself. Uh, even though you know it's a virtual human, you feel very much like you're Skyping with a regular person on the other end. Because some of the abnormalities that you would normally see, such as weird lighting and shading and maybe glitchy facial features and robotic sounding voices, you sort of write off to the expectations that, well, the communication channel isn't as high fidelity as the real world. And so, in a way, the limitations of the means you're using to communicate with that virtual human make that virtual human appear more realistic than it might actually be. So keep, in, keep that in mind when working with virtual characters. Uh, people are going to become attached to them. They're going to feel comfortable around them. But if you want to go for realism, you might want to throttle the communication channel that you're interacting with them with, uh, with something like this. Okay, so uh, that's our, our super brief uh, introduction to uh, virtual humans. Uh, if you have any questions about your assignments or anything, please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. I'm going to be around. I do virtual office hours every weekday from 3 to 4 p.m., but I will set up a time to Skype with you uh, uh, individually if you need to, if you can't meet within those regular hours. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will see you guys in cyberspace. Bye-bye.